Hello, what's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of Hobby Weekly Market Chat. I'm your host today. I'm Johnny, and we also have Ben here. Hey, Ben, how are you today? Hi, hi, buddy. Uh, hi, Johnny. Thanks for having me again. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, think first of all, we have to wish everybody a happy new year, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Happy new year. And it's our first like uh weekly market chat after the new year, so uh, hope yeah. everybody's like fresh and back to work, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And also thanks to uh, our audience who have been watching our episodes in the past year and um, we'll, we hope that we, we're going to deliver <clears throat> some uh, the, the best quality of content later on in this year. And yeah, that's a uh, happy new year to all of you guys. Yes, so um, you. yeah, let me just lay down the agenda for today. Um, we're going to update uh, you guys with the latest news and also a uh, macro uh, macro overview of the current market and then in the in the later on session we're gonna uh, discover some and uh, discuss some something about uh, something about Bitcoin on tree metrics and also some of my research findings that I have been doing uh, about macro liquidity uh, in relation to Bitcoin's prices and yeah can't wait to share my findings with you guys later on so um, uh, Ben will you take over for the macro update? I think we have some important economic events coming tomorrow and also on on Friday and yeah FOMC meeting and also non farm payroll right? and yeah yeah probably think, what should we pay attention to yeah yeah I think this week there's a lot of uh, events that are especially starting today you no know? so uh, let's uh, move on to micro updates first so uh just a quick summary of what happened in uh, twenty twenty two. So for 2022, S&P 500 shed about 90.4%, which is roughly around 3, 3, 8 trillion US dollar decline in market time. While the NASDAQ, you know, during a bear market, uh, tech stocks or growth stocks tend to uh, fall more just due to the business uh, bust and boom cycle. So NASDAQ uh, comprises mostly tech stocks and growth stocks fell around 33.1%. Yep. So, as uh, what Johnny mentioned, uh, well, there's a lot of events going on, uh, starting uh, later on today. So, firstly, most importantly, is the Fed Minutes release uh, later at uh, 8 a.m. GMT plus 8. Uh, eight sorry, uh, 3 a.m. GMT plus 8 for December's uh, Fed uh, FOMC December uh, policy meeting. So they, this will give a brief summary of what you know, they discussed uh, during December's meeting. So I think this is very important because uh, the Feds, every quarterly, they will uh, give the projections of uh, their policies, meaning that uh, what's the interest rate projection for the next quarter or the next year, or what's the, you know, how GDP will be like, how's the estimates. So uh, there's uh, quite a big, I would say a big revision for what they said on the, after the December's meeting. So uh, let's, uh, maybe we can talk about it more in the journey. So, okay. so uh, for December's meeting, the FOMC, they, uh, they raised interest rates by 50 basis points after 475 basis points hike. And most importantly is they signal that they will continue to stay higher. Uh, the rates will stay higher longer uh, for a longer period of time. So this, uh, I think uh, the market should react more hawkish, right, Johnny? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like uh, if, like, yeah, for example... My headphones not working, so... Okay, so... Okay, sure. Yeah. So, um, okay, go ahead, thanks. Okay, so... Uh, if I mean for for most people like us, like we for general borrowings, uh, for example, we to pay for our mortgage loans. The you know, high interest rates is extremely painful because it's like additional a few more hundred, maybe a thousand more bucks, thousand more bucks for our uh for interest payments. So and this, if you put that from a company's perspective, it cuts uh their capex, the cash flow, and operating profits. So hence, um, what is why markets actually more bearish in uh, 
the Fed starts to raise interest rate. So a longer, a more prolonged, uh, high interest rate environment will mean business will you know will suffer. And uh, you know, for the past one year, the the equities uh sector has uh actually hit, hit pretty bad. Okay, so a conclusion from uh last month December's meeting, uh as I mentioned, there's new projections with expected uh, inflation to end twenty twenty three, uh higher than higher than they previously thought. So uh, this led to surprisingly widespread support in the projections for notions that interest rate need to rise above five percent in twenty twenty three. So if you look at the graph on the right, the graph on the right is the C CME's uh projections. Uh, or we say they factor in the price in the probabilities for different periods based on the uh interest rate features from prices, right? So is, you see, actually, uh, compared to what the FOMC mentioned in December, the market is actually more, I would say, more dovish. So they're, they're pretty positive because uh, if you look at it, it's, uh, they're expecting, uh, most of the market participants are expecting uh, interest rates to hold at around 475 to 500 basis points. Compared to the Fed's uh, you know, and projections of above five percent in twenty twenty three, so however, you know, you know, if what tonight's uh minutes were to come up with that to show that you know the Fed's are actually more hawkish, you will see uh the market will actually become more volatile moving forward. Yeah, because more market participants you know pricing a high interest rates in 2023. And also uh, they will see uh previously they expect uh, the inflation to hit around 2.8% uh by end of 2023. Uh however they revised it back up to 3.1%. So they actually you know they actually know expect inflation to be more sticky. Uh hence they revised up their inflation uh first. And uh, move next to the second part. Just now I mentioned is uh tonight's uh FOMC meeting, uh minutes minutes sorry, and later uh to, later the in the week will be more numbers more data from the uh, U.S. labor market. So uh a lot of uh market participants are you no know, expecting a weaker labor market due to the high interest rate environment. So you know this could this weakness in labor market will actually give back a reason to you know, ease their monetary policy tightening. So they won't be so uh, hawkish and actually keep interest rate high and very long period of time. However, um, you know, past, past a few uh, labor market, uh, labor data released, the pretty, uh, pretty good of seed market speculations. Hence, uh, the Fed actually, you know, they are more aggressive in the interest rate time. So the labor market is strong, but the Fed will actually be more aggressive. So for Friday, uh, Friday will be the North Farm payroll, which is a monthly event every first Friday of every month. So uh, expected there will be a quarter thousand uh, increase in the uh, North Farm payrolls, uh, job created. Uh, and also Friday, there's also uh, un U.S. unemployment data uh, out. So expectations for U.S. unemployment to be remain unchanged at 3.7%. And this shows that, you know, uh, Fed, uh, the U.S. labor market is very tight and strong. Hence, the Fed can actually be more aggressive. And uh, I think we mentioned about, you know, having a strong labor market with high inflation, yeah, wage, wages going up higher than PCE, you know, PC data, uh, you actually see inflation to become more sticky for a longer period of time because, you know, when people are earning more, they have more expendable income, they tend to uh, chase after uh, more goods, right? So we assume that, uh, you know, uh, the supply of goods in the market 
is limited. However, they have a lot of money flowing around. So there's more supply money choosing limited goods, hence uh, the goods inflation is more steep. And if uh, more people are more working now, it makes uh, inflation be uh, no, even longer lasting than expected. Hence, the Fed's actually raised their interest rate, uh, I mean, their uh, inflation uh, rate projection to higher than expected. Okay, so other than the non farm payroll, Friday's non farm payroll and unemployment data, we have uh, today as well, uh, ISM manufacturing report. So, expectation for ISM is uh, lower than previous. So, it's, uh, you know, it's equals to, it's, it's the, it pays, you know, the narrative of high interest rates, manufacturing should uh, go down because uh, cost of goods and services and stuff like that. So, yeah. Hence, uh, I have ISM expectation is lower than previous. However, uh, jobs, uh, jobs opening is also another in indicator from the Fed. Uh, they expect uh, expectation of 10 million uh, job openings uh, versus previous uh, data of 10.334. So for jobs, uh, if you compare uh, the previous few months of uh, this data, uh, I think most expectation covers around 10 million and most of the time it's either you know, meeting or exceeding expectation even if the base expectation is only a slight bit. so it's not uh it's not a very big in indicator unless you know uh, a rare case of a uh, sudden drop of 8 million to 8 million is a very big drop so it will actually cause more volatility if you know, if it really happens so as long as it stays within the range of 10 million, everything should be fine. And also our weekly initial jobless claims on Thursday, tomorrow, uh, expectation of two to 5,000 versus previous of two to 5,000 as well. So uh, expectation is that uh, uh, the uh, job market is too strong. So there won't be a lot of people uh, jobless because less companies are firing people or laying off people. And based on five, uh, the past results, uh, this initial jobless claims has five consecutive weeks of predicting or meeting expectation. And it also shows that, you know, uh, the US labor market is pretty strong. Hence, uh, inflation is uh, there to stay for a longer period of time. And lastly, is the non farm payroll. And based on the past eight months of data, uh, non farm payroll has been exceeding and beating expectation for uh for eight months already. So uh it's also another science of a strong US strong labor market as well. And uh, you can refer to that's what I mentioned about you know wage uh and PC. So PC is a personal consumption expenditure. It's also a key uh, data that the US Fed actually consider in their policy. So uh for the red one is the PCE, right? And the black line, uh, okay, okay. Okay. the red one is the PC, and the black line is the average hourly earnings uh, for the US uh, income earners. So, from ever since the uh, COVID 19 in early 2021, yeah, early 2021, right? Uh, I forgot the date, sorry. Uh, but anyway, uh, you see, uh, ever since 20, uh, mid of 2021, wages starts to over to you know catch up with uh, PCE prices, you know, and uh, surpass it. So, based on this data, you can see that uh, people are actually earning more than what they can spend. Uh, it's in a sense, in in a way, it it says that you know it shows that there's a lot of money, uh, there's an oversupply of money in the uh, uh in the U.S. system that uh you know, chasing after the uh, limited uh supply of goods, hence uh we need the U.S. needs to actually lower the U.S. uh wage growth to actually uh, for the PC to actually catch up. So to in order for that to happen, and also 
uh, inflation is to keep inflation down also. So this is one that we, this the few indicators we should actually consider looking at of the US average only earnings and the PC price uh, index. Yeah, this is all for um, this one. Pass it on to Johnny. Johnny, I think you are on mute. Yeah, I'm sorry, sorry, I just muted. So thanks thanks for uh, covering us the macro part and make sure you stay updated to the uh, economic activities, economic data coming out. Um, I think FOMC coming out tomorrow night. And also um, in next week, we're gonna uh, discuss the market reaction to these economic events. And probably uh, we'll have some insights into uh, future forecasts, whether uh, the market will go sideways or uptrend or downtrend and with, uh, with respect to the economic data. So um, so right now I, I would like to um, share my screen and yeah. Sure. Yeah, so thanks, would you like to pause it? Yeah, <clears throat> wait a minute, yeah. Okay, right now let's see the price action of Bitcoin and we're now still in the trading range. I think um, we're now trading at uh, 1600, one, uh, 1600 <clears throat> and uh, it's worth noticing that actually the, the volume was uh, diminishing when uh, we had a dip there. And that was actually, uh, we, we could we could interpret that the, the sellers have already been flushed out and we are now seeing less selling pressure in the market. And therefore um, the price we tested, the, uh, 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 we tested up, up upwards and then uh, probably going to see some more upward upward uh, ac uh, action. And if you look at Ethereum, <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm a little bit sick. My voice is not very good today. So wait a minute. Let me get to Ethereum. So I think we, Ethereum has been outperforming Bitcoin. And if we look at the chart here, Ethereum versus Bitcoin, I'm sorry, I'm going to mess up here. Ethereum versus Bitcoin broke out of the, of the trend line here. And... And yeah, it has been outperforming Bitcoin for some time. And now, right now, right now, so let me get back to the price action here. <clears throat> we're still in the trading range, but we're more uh, trading uh, towards the up, up, upper boundary of the trading range. There's a possibility that we might as well retest the upper boundary, but in my opinion, just my personal opinion, I think this supply zone is going to, it's gonna um, give us a little bit of selling pressure here first, and then let's see how 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 market we at in, in this zone, and then and then we we're gonna we're gonna see how is it going later on. But I think the supply zone gonna be tested first. Either is it, it will be turned into a support or resistance, and this zone should be washed out. And wait a minute. So uh, in terms of liquidity, actually, I want to share with you some of my research findings um let me share let me share <clears throat> actually actually so, johnny recently yeah. there's not yeah. a lot of uh bad I, I i think i would say that there, there are not a lot of uh negative or leader positive over the holiday season yeah uh, actually um the the market volatility has come to a a very low point in the, I would say historical low point, um, and since the FTX collapse, and then we we didn't really have any other bad news coming out, and I I take it as a good news because no bad news is good news, and um, actually if we look at some Bitcoin metrics here, let me just uh, run you through this one. Um, we, if we look at the, the price models of Bitcoin, we're actually very close to the bottom price model. So the CVDD uh, is actually a, a indicator suggested by by Woody Wu, and historically it has been you know predicting and, and aligning with market bottoms very nicely in 2019, 2015, and also. Um, we have come to a very close position to the CVDD. So how it's actually uh, created, CVDD is actually created by taking the, the average transaction price of Bitcoin and then it's calibrated by a, by, uh, by a, a constant and then um, 
uh, we just find out that this uh, indicator has been respecting the the historical bottoms of Bitcoin, and the, I think there's a chance that uh, Bitcoin is gonna respect CBDC as well in this in this in this year end 2022 end here. And you just talked about um, uh, we're we're now seeing a very very little volatility and not not much news coming out, no good news, no bad news. And if we look back into historical market bottoms, usually uh we didn't have a lot of good news either right we we, we didn't uh, that's that's mainly after after bad news and then uh we, we we came to a period of uh absolute deadness like um people were so frustrated yeah. and then yeah the market was so quiet usually smart money work remember, remember like during uh the last bear market i think it's uh, <clears throat> last year last year uh I think I'm not wrong, it's last year. So, I mean, 2021, sorry. No, 2021, okay, 2021. Still, my mind is still like in 2022. So, okay, in okay. 2021, uh, yeah. after the May 19th, yeah. May 19th yeah. collapse, uh, yeah. everything was, I remember it's like there's bad news and bad news and bad news. Then after yeah. that, there was a period of very quiet, yeah. Uh, that after we don't know what's happening, and suddenly, uh, the odd chains, uh, and the uh, NFT craze suddenly came in. Right? And, yeah, and, yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Yeah, so the, this, I, I think we are at this point, whether you know, everybody is like, you know, deciding which side we want to be on. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, in twenty twenty one, um. Let's look at this model, right? The BTC realized profit and loss. So the purple line represents um, the money loss in the market and the profits that people gained in the market. So in turn around, if we look, look, look at the bottom there, uh, we can see that the realized loss uh, showed a divergence with the dipping of the price, right? So the price dipped lower, but less money was lost in the market, which means that which meant that uh, less sellers were forced to sell. And the capitulation, the capitulation was less, uh, less massive than the previous one, and that usually um, uh, echo with uh, the behavior of most most of the market participants. So you mentioned something like uh, people were uh, not very proactive in the market, and people were not trading. We, we had very low volatility at the time. No, no bad news, no good news. Okay, so at that time the market bottomed, right? And yeah. it, you know, if we just uh, zoom in a little bit, and this dip, the lowest dip, was marked with a very small um, realized loss. Okay, so what it means that <clears throat> even the price dip lower, uh, actually no one's forced to sell and no one's willing to sell at that point. So uh, no sellers, I would take it as bullish. So. Um, uh, given other maybe um, positive uh, liquidity and also other factors driving the market, and then um, it, it could drive up to 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 uh, the previous high or uh, develop an uptrend very easily because the resistance was very uh, was first uh, was first more. So less sellers means resistance uh, was more. Uh, I would take it that way. So um, I would actually like to, you know point out to another another <clears throat> model so in 2021 um uh it's here right but uh it's not the market bottom uh, it's a mini bear market but uh when we compare it to uh historical bitcoin cycles uh i i i, I divided uh the bitcoin cycles into four year cycle because uh you know bitcoin halving usually takes four years and if we if we look at the cycles from uh, 2013, and then we have four years from 2013 to 2016, marked by the blue line, and then we have 2017 to 2020 marked by the orange line, and then we also have the current uh, current cycle marked by the green line. So uh, in 2021, it's very interesting. It's very interesting because it it is marked at I think it's 45, 40 to uh, is marked between the period of 40th to 50th day in the cycle and you know there was a dip right it's a coincidence um, yeah. I think 
yeah, very interesting to to notice that. And yeah, just um, I, I you know I just want to discuss this thing with you because uh, uh, it's it's just coincidence, right? And we can you know delve into the reasons why uh, the market we acted like that, and then uh, what we're seeing now, we are also in the historical value zone with regards to timing, and then we are now uh, in the mid cycle. Um, if we uh, count it uh, in a four year four year timeline, and then we are now at the middle, right, 180 day, and then usually uh, historically when we compare to the previous two cycles, uh, bottom formed there. And you know, smart money would accumulate um, it, uh, starting from 180 day. I, I highlight in the blue uh, blue area, the blue highlight, and that period I would take it as an uh, uh, as a a value zone for accumulation. Uh, right, it's very interesting. Yeah. And um, yeah, oh, I, for I forgot to add the the Bitcoin halving date. Uh, I think it's it, it's somewhere later. Like uh, two hundred and seventy to to the three hundredth day of each cycle, the Bitcoin having days was later on in the in in the chart. So um, very interesting that we see uh, historically uh, Bitcoin started to form the bottom uh, on the one hundred and eighty day. Uh, yeah, in in the blue shaded area. Yeah, uh, what's your view? What's your view on this, friends? Isn't it very interesting? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is, the first, this is my first time looking at this. Uh, also. And that, it's definitely interesting because I think uh, I think just last week, uh, or maybe a few days ago, MicroStrategy said that they actually bought more BDC, right? I oh, think I, just I, la I think last week. Yeah, MicroStrategy. Really? Yeah, they bought more. So, because, um, um, you know, two weeks before, I, I heard that MicroStrategy liquidated some of their Bitcoin holdings to avoid margin calling, right? Yeah. Really? What's that? <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe it's fake news on Twitter. You know, a lot of fake news coming out. But yeah, it's just fact chatter. But if Michael Strange really, really added to to their balance sheet, and that would be uh, also a, a bullish news to us, right? Yes. Yeah. But I think Michael Strange has been DCAING all the time. You know, yes, yes, in yes, the bear market. Definitely. I think they yeah. they just don't want to time the market and have been doing DCAs all the way, right? But I think right now. Uh, like uh, when I mentioned, like, oh, there's no negative uh news coming out from I mean most chains or uh, most uh social platforms. I think around the whole uh the whole crypto scene is only looking at you know the Gemini, Genesis and the TCG and Grayscale whole saga because. A lot. Some people are saying that uh, Gemini <coughs> wants uh, Genesis to actually pay back, uh, you know, the money they borrowed on uh, yeah. on eighth of January, right? However, based on you know, the mutual agreement or the con the loan contract, uh, it's only like May that uh, you know, Genesis has to pay back, okay. right? So, uh, there's a lot of, like uh ongoing. Uh, there's maybe this fake news or people uncertain whether the people are gonna. Uh, DCG is gonna liquidate Grayscale or you know Grayscale other holdings to actually uh, pay back you know uh get Gemini's uh money. However, you know based uh, based on what I see or what I read, I think we already know when you know when it comes to May because that's the final date for repayment, right? Uh, it's it's not January, so unless Genesis declare bankrupt, then uh well, Gemini has right to actually claim that money so for now i think everything is still okay so i think there's no duty right now yeah and i think right now the most positive news coming up is uh ever since the ftx incident uh i, I think everybody is like looking at solana because you know, solana everybody, everybody was like every day uh, you know FP, spf has a lot of uh control over or has a lot of influence over uh, Solana chain uh, and a lot of this yeah. whole yeah. ecosystem, right? So, yeah. uh, but we just had a short squeeze, you know. We just had a short squeeze from from maybe I think seven dollars all the way up to thirteen dollars, and then we are now exactly. testing fifteen dollars. Oh, that's crazy! Yeah, that's super crazy. It's, it's like uh, on on the thirtieth of December, right? Uh, so when we, uh uh Buterin, Vitalik Buterin, okay, uh, he. Uh, tweeted saying that you know 
uh, so in, uh, some smart people know him. Uh, so in, uh, is a good chain and you know should give Solana a chance or something along the line along the line. And uh, up, right after that, you know, Solana starts to actually move upwards. And just yesterday, because uh, I think we you know uh Johnny and I used to you know we used to host uh Eric from ING, right? So uh from ING Injective actually tweeted about Solana as well, saying that Solana is coming to ING chain and also going to Cosmos as well. So oh, yeah. I think it's a lot of things, good things are going on for Solana. The after uh they fought the serum uh serum decks and a lot of uh I think two blue chip NFTs of Solana moved to Polygon and uh, Ethereum. I think right after I think after all these bad things, I, I think Solana is I think is a good start for the whole crypto community. Right? So I think right now, uh based on these models, I think everything times up very perfectly. That uh, uh this timing, uh and this might the end of the cycle, uh although macro environment doesn't doesn't you know that just shows that but we all yeah. know that by the end yeah. or mid of next year or this year, uh yeah. interest rate will uh start to uh go down. And this is the period of time where uh people will FOMO in, right? FOMO in uh why they didn't buy earlier. Yeah, I think right yeah. now is a period of accumulation that like what you mentioned. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, talking about uh Michael Legridley, um it's it's not ready. Uh, yeah, yeah. You you're right. Uh, I, you know, I agree with you because we're now uh, we we are not we're we're so far away from cutting rates, right? We're just you know having a slower rate hikes, but it doesn't mean that we we're gonna cut rates, right? And and, and QT is gonna continue, right? Yep. And if we look at, <clears throat> I'm sorry, if we look at the uh, Fed balance sheet, because you know remember we we talked about um the 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 Federal Reserve's balance sheet, and also we. We we try to take out the the relationship between the money created by the Federal Reserve and uh, uh risky assets prices, and then we can actually see a, a general I would say general positive correlation between the two. So uh, starting from twenty twenty May, uh the the Federal Reserve <clears throat> just inflated balance sheets, uh I think uh, a a few trillion dollars, and then. And then bank reserves also inflate uh, as well, and then we started to see asset uh, risky assets pumped. Right, uh, the orange line we have here is is Bitcoin. We can see that you know a general positive correlation between between the two, and also uh, it's very logical and reasonable to think that the um, uh, the liquidity from the Federal Reserve side is leading. Right, it's leading. So uh, the liquidity pump first, and then we see the money being circulated into different markets. For example, the risky assets, we have Bitcoin spread uh, pumping as well. And also uh, the the green line, the green line, I think is Ethereum. And then I think I also have a chart featuring Nasdaq, but uh, I'm not sure it's here. Yeah, here, here. Uh, the blue line, the blue line is, is Nasdaq and also the bank reserve, bank deposits, a general positive correlation, right? But you know, seeing um, in recent price act, uh, in recent actions, in recent in recent times, we are seeing um, a, a slow reduction in in the total uh, uh, amount of the Fed balance sheet. And also, if you look at the net liquidity, uh, the net liquidity actually uh, is the uh, Fed balance sheet minus the TJ account, which is used by Fed to to manipulate the market, and also we minus the reverse repo. And then the reverse rule, I talked about it many times before in our previous episodes, it was actually an issue used by the Federal Reserve to, to withdraw liquidity from the market. And therefore, the nature of reverse repo and also TGA uh, is the same. And therefore, we have the Federal Reserve balance sheet minus TGA and also minus reverse repo. And then we have the net liquidity. The net liquidity is actually the purple line. And then we are seeing that, <clears throat> yeah, let me zoom in. The purple line here, yeah, it's it's actually leading a little bit, right? You can you see that bands yeah. it's actually leading Ethereum also Bitcoin a little bit. And so but we're now seeing a, a, a decorrelation a little bit because uh uh in 
in in November we had the FTX uh, collapse, and therefore we we didn't see a, a strong correlation there. But hopefully we 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 get back to the correlation. If we look at the reverse repo here, um, you know Nasdaq and also inverted RLP was uh, correlating very closely. But you know, due to the November FTX collapse, crypto market just dumped, and uh, we were trading sideways. And uh, it's actually very important to monitor the liquidity, the liquidity side of of the <clears throat> of the Federal Reserve, because <clears throat> you know we might actually want to see that if the quantitative tight point will continue, or uh, if it's if it's paused or uh, QE actually um, uh, silently slipped in, we actually want to notice the, the change in trends. But right now, we didn't see any change in trends. You can clearly see that the uh, uh, the Federal Reserve balance sheet is, is deflating and assets being, being you know, taken away from the market. And also the liquidity has been on the decrease from uh, January of 2022. And that actually marked the beginning of the of the bear market cycle, right? And yeah. yeah, and Bitcoin actually topped in, I think it's in December twenty twenty one, and it actually from one from one market, and it's very interesting to see that. And but you know, getting back to the Bitcoin price models, uh, uh what I could say is we're, we're close to the bottom, but the macro liquidity is not ready yet. So, um, you know, given that um, if if the Federal Reserve is pivoting away from its hawkish um, uh, monetary policy, and then that would be the bottom. But, you know, even if in Bitcoin's price model is showing bottom, but the macro liquidity is not very uh, bullish on, on, on risky assets, and then we, we couldn't see pump in credit market, but... We might see a, a long sideways action. We, we could see a long accumulation sideways action. And that's my point of view. Uh, it doesn't mean that Bitcoin's price is going to collapse. No, but we could enter a long period of accumulation, just like what we had in, um, I think it's 2015, right? Uh, so uh, at that time, I think we had uh, almost one year. Yeah, 2015 January here, and then 2016 January here, maybe. Uh, more than half a year um, accumulation range, right? This so you spot that? Yeah, I think it's almost nine months. Of yeah, yeah, almost nine months. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So market would not, you know, market three, uh, three directions. So uh, sideways, uptrend, downtrend. So if it's not downtrend, because uh, it, it, no, 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 I mean, if it's not uptrend and then the possibility is only sideways and also downtrend, so I think the two possible uh these two possibilities would be uh, bigger than uptrend, right? Because macro liquidity is not ready, and in my opinion, we might enter a long period of accumulation period. That's my point of view. Yeah. <clears throat> what oh, do you think about like, it? Thanks. I just want to touch a little bit on the macro liquidity part because uh, I think yeah yeah two 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 sessions back when we had our guest Derek from Operation Side came over. I did mention about uh, whether the Fed is taking uh, the can down the road, you know, uh, on their monetary policy because I mentioned that uh, the money supply or the liquidity they pumped into the market yeah. uh, during the COVID time. Uh, this is why, one of the reasons why inflation is so high currently, right? So yeah. uh, if you move on to maybe end of the year, or a year later, right? Uh, inflation numbers won't be as scary as what it is right now because it's compared to the years prior. So next year's uh, CPI numbers against the current CPI's number, it won't be like oh, a very big like eight percent or five percent. I think uh, if the Fed continue to you know uh, make the monetary policy uh, like more conservative conservatively right now, mm -hmm. which is like around 5% uh, or for a longer period of time, without mm -hmm. destroying so much liquidity in the market, it won't crash the market. As we mm -hmm. see that, you know, the M2 supply is still very high. The balance sheet is still very high. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So this is like really, they, they really don't, from my opinion, is they don't care about the, 
their the amount of money they printed already. You know, it's yeah. it's like some cost for them. Right now is they need to keep their KPI numbers there for next year. So the increase yeah. interest rate, they keep inflation low. And if inflation is low, everybody's happy and they move on from that. Yeah. So I yeah. think uh as long as the Fed don't like uh, remove all the liquidity they pumped in, you know, uh during the COVID COVID time. Uh yeah. they didn't do anything drastic to whatever that uh whatever the money supply of is out there. I uh yeah. I think uh, uh risky assets like equities, uh be it, uh crypto assets, uh or high yield bonds or whatever. Um yeah. this is where uh uh when doing time accumulation is the time I feel that you know, uh we can do some DCA to actually no because we know that uh, a few months down the road or half year down the road later. Uh, the Fed will be even, the numbers will be good, will be good. Yeah. Uh, they, yeah. No, everything will still be good. No, this is not so, investment advice. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, letting you guys know, but I think uh, you know, based on what we, if you follow us based on what we have talked uh, for the past uh, maybe two three mm-hmm. months, uh, I think uh, we we do give uh uh good professional opinions as well. So uh. I think uh, you should actually consider uh, some of our thoughts as well. Yeah. yeah, and also I would like to add to your point that uh, let's imagine that uh, Federal Reserve is going to pivot, it, you know, half a year later, maybe at the end of two or two, three. And then what we will be expecting is that the reverse ripple level going coming down, right? Uh, that would be the, the positive sign for, for the Fed pivot and also for risk assets. Because the reverse repo has been the the safe money haven for for most of the investors. They pot their money with Fed and they earn the interest rate uh, risk free. It's actually risk free. So uh, if we uh, yeah, let me just give you a more uh, one more explanation. You know, if we if we you know just look at the chart and then uh, since two 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 one May, uh, the reverse repo level is coming up uh, from uh, from near to zero, close to zero to. Uh, two thousand and five hundred billions of dollars in USD, and then the the QT actually, you know, silently happened there since two to one May. But they spent down the TGA, and uh, uh, spending down TGA means that the the the, the government uh, uh spend the budgets, and then the money circulated into the economy, and then it offset the 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 QT effect of the reverse repo. So we we started to see uh uh the balance sheet. And also, uh, the money being being withdrawn from the market, the effects start to happen somewhere around early twenty twenty one. So, as, as the the net liquidity suggests, so uh, you know, let's let's assume that you know, uh, the Federal Reserve is going to pivot somewhere and and later in two or two three, and then we're going to monitor the reverse repo level. We want to see it's in a clear downtrend. Also, we want to see we want to see yields coming down. Currently, yields are. Uh, a very high and you know just a very general inverse correlation of yields with risky assets i'm sorry so we are now seeing that the bank deposits has been you know coming coming to a flat flat position but you know it has not started to has not started to to, to cooling down Either so, yields are still still going up, and then the red lines is the um, Fed funds rate, and then it's, it's catching up the yields. So it historically, um, um, you know, the Fed funds rate has to catch up with the CPI in order to, you know, in order to cool down the inflation. Right? I'm sorry, Benz, would you like to take? Over? I'm having a runny nose. Yeah, I, I think I think uh both Johnny and I has like uh covered uh most of uh what we wanted to talk about today. Firstly, uh the macro events uh and maybe recap the macro events which is uh, coming up tonight. Most important is the uh Fed's meet Fed's minutes for December's meeting and later at three a.m. GMT plus eight. And also, I think uh, the ISM manufacturing data is out already. Uh, expectation is a uh, 48.5. Uh, not sure. Uh, just let me give me a quick uh, 
refresh the data. Uh, the voice refreshing. Uh, and also uh jobs, uh jobs opening as well is coming up today. So there's a lot of data. Company data is coming up today. So there might be a lot of market volatility for the next few days, especially those uh, uh trading uh equities as well. Uh, there's an initial job that's team data on Thursday, and also uh North of payrolls on Friday as well as uh, U.S. unemployment data on Friday. So, okay, so I uh, just received the ISM data, which is uh, expectation was 48.5. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, 48.5 uh, is coming out at 11 p.m. later. So, I uh, can take note on that. So, uh, higher reading means uh, higher uh, survey uh, done, higher expectation of the manufacturing sector. So yeah, uh, I think uh, that's all for uh, me. Yep, Johnny. I think you mute, you muted yourself. Uh, Johnny, I think you muted yourself. No, oh, I'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> I just built it. So uh, let's wrap it up and you know uh, just do a, a brief summary on the on the on the on the on the things that we talked about. So uh first thing first, um Bitcoin price has come to a historical um uh, value zone suggested by the uh, four year cycle model, but you know the macro macro side is not yet ready and we think that we are still far away from cutting braids and QT is gonna continue and therefore there's no is there's nowhere near to uh, the, the start of the uptrend, right, Benz? And I, uh, I, I strongly think that we would enter a long period of accumulation period and even sideways to the downwards. And, you know, that's, uh, you know, based on the information I have right now, that's the conclusion also summary I can give. And yeah, that's my part. And then uh, Benz also covered uh, some uh, economic events coming in uh, tomorrow and also and also on Friday, and uh, I, I think that the important important event would be FOMC uh, meeting uh, uh, that the, the the minutes release, and also the non farm payroll, which suggests the uh, the the strength of the of the, of the labor market. So, market my my we add to to these two economic data <clears throat> more actively, right? Yeah. So, yeah, and I think uh, next week we can uh, revise the the economic. Data and you know we, we can we can delve into uh, how market will add to the data and then we're gonna share more till then. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, and you know I I think I think we, um, yeah I think we've come to uh we've I've already shared a lot of things, and let's see Ben if you want to add, add some anything. Uh, nothing else from me. So uh, I think lastly is the. Uh, the Bobby Research uh, website. So we have a lot of uh, research uh, that we uh, wrote, wrote on from Bobby Research, published on Medium, as well as a uh, website that uh, uh, I think it was below just now. So in the PowerPoint slides. Uh, so if you wish to know more about uh, the models that we previously just now talked about, basically the uh, we must be graph as well as uh, other research on uh, what happened in FTAX and stuff like that or for the whole of, we have our annual report for 2022 as well we have some projections of uh, what is expected for 2023 so uh, if you are interested you can look for the uh, for the end for the reports uh, on our website as well as our median uh, account and uh, yeah that's all for tonight and uh, See you uh next week uh on when next week Wednesday uh night yeah yeah okay yeah. bye bye see you events uh, thank you guys for listening and yeah see you next week.